Yo, hey, what is up, guys? And welcome to the first ever Uppercut Deluxe Virtual Education Online Stream. I'm your host, Riley Moore. And uh, if you're not familiar with what we do at Uppercut Deluxe, we're an Australian men's grooming brand uh, born from the counterculture of surf, skate, and moto. We're a barber owned brand originating from Australia. You know, we're known for our grooming products. We do it all, man. We do it all from pre style through to our pomades including our texturizing powders. We also have a range of accessories. We do a beard range, and we've also got a sick wash range too. We do it all. Uh, we're stoked to be introducing our virtual education platform. Uh, this has been a long time coming. This has been 12 months of, of research and development, and, and yeah, we couldn't be happier with the outcome, what we're here to share tonight. It's really something special. Uh, tonight, we're over at uh, Northwest Barbaco, in uh, the northwest of England, in a town called Clitheroe. Uh, we're going to do a classic session with Uppercut Deluxe Ambassador and Northwest Barbaco owner, Christopher Brownless. Oh, Chris Brownless. <laughs> uh, we encourage you guys to ask some questions. Fire me in. We've got the chat live and running, and uh, we'll endeavor to answer as many of them as we possibly can and be as engaged as we can. You know, nothing's off limits. You know, if there's anything you want to know, be it about the brand, about the cut, about Chris Brownless himself, you know, about his experiences. Uh, just drop it in that chat box and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it as, as many as we can. Uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Chris Brownie. Thank you, Riley. That was a wonderful introduction. You smashed it. <laughs> cool, yeah, so thanks everyone. Um, as Riley said, I'm Chris Brownless. I own a shop called Northwest Barbaco. Here I am, hello. Um, I own a shop called Northwest Barbaco in the northwest of England. So yeah, if you are anywhere else in the world other than where we are, thanks for joining us. This is cool. Um, I've been a barber now for a long time. Originated as a, a unisex hairdresser probably about 13 years ago now. Um, there's a very long story. We're not going to bore you with it all tonight, but I'm going to go through beginning to end how I do full haircut, how I do a full service. Um, share some knowledge with you, share some stories, hopefully answer some questions. Um, I've got an awesome model, um, our man Eugene, who you'll see very soon. Um, so it's a little bit about me and the brand. Uh, I've been with Uppercut Deluxe for one, two, three, four, five or six years now. Um, around 2015, I started as an ambassador. Um, I've worked on the road, cut all over Europe. Uh, I've been out to places sort of like Canada, um, with our wonderful team who took me under their wing and showed the ropes. So yeah, hopefully I can pass some of that on to you guys tonight. So um, the next thing we're going to do is get our model in the chair. And while we do, I'll tell you a bit about tonight's session. So Eugene, it's your time to shine, brother. Everyone put your hands together for Eugene. Eugene is uh, <laughs> Eugene's one of my Ooh. clients. I've cut Eugene's hair for a very long time. Five, six years, you think? Because oh, you came to the original shop location, okay. right? Yeah. yeah, cool. So yeah, I've cut Eugene's hair for a long time. Um, as you can tell, he's a cool guy. And if you can't tell, you'll just have to take my word for that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we're going to do a classic session tonight, which is again, like Riley said, something we've worked for a really long time on now. Um, obviously COVID has slowed a lot of things down and means we're all here wearing masks, which is a little bit strange, but you know, we've all had a test this morning again, a little bit strange, but we wanted to get this out. We've worked for a long time to get it there. So. We're going to do a classic session and I'll tell you why in a second. So I'm just going to grab a couple of tools and talk through exactly what an Uppercut Deluxe classic haircut is while I get Eugene prepped. So Eugene's just walked in. This is how his hair was when he walked through the door. We've done no prep. I haven't seen Eugene for maybe like five or six months. So um, yeah, Uppercut Deluxe classics. So for the people who are familiar with the brand, you probably know a little bit of this already, but for the people watching this that don't, um, Uppercut Deluxe is heavily influenced by the 1950s barbershop, the ethos of anyone can walk through the door and walk out feeling and looking a million dollars. So those classic looks are something that I personally really enjoy and put, put a lot of attention into my work. So this is my bread and butter, so to speak, if you will, um, which is why Eugene still comes and sits in my chair because that's, uh, that's his style. So. Yeah, we're going to go through beginning to end um, consultation, uh, 
how I'm going to cut his hair. I'm going to show you how I'm going to section his hair. I'm going to show you how to style it, how I'm going to choose what product, all of the, uh, all of the good stuff. So what we like to call the first step, and I call it step zero because this starts before Eugene walked through the door is hygiene. So step zero, hygiene. It's indefinite. It becomes before, it comes during, it's after. It never stops. So it's not step one, it's not step four. Eugene will vouch for this, hopefully, that you know, I could take pride in the shop and I to take pride in absolutely everything from the smallest details when you walk through the door to how we service our tools, etc. So hygiene is a huge thing, um, which is why we call it step zero because it is indefinite. Clean tools, service tools, clean chair, clean gowns, absolutely everything is spotless and there's a few reasons the stuff that we learn at college about you know passing germs from client to client or barber to client or client to barber especially in the time we live in at the moment of covid the hygiene protocols as like i said earlier we've done tests and stuff you know that would not normally be a thing but here we are so yeah hygiene's huge for me because everything about being a barber for me is my existence. It's how I pay my bills. It's how I socialize during the day. Um, it's how I enjoy to live my life. So this is listed as step zero because it's always the most important factor in making sure Eugene comes back to sit in my chair. So if he walks in through the door and the first thing he sees is something unhygienic, it's a negative point on your scorecard immediately. So hygiene is important to me because it's all about getting Eugene to want to come back in this chair. So service overrules everything and hygiene plays such a big part in that and it's something that gets drilled into you when you study hairdressing or barbering and when you're young you're kind of like i just want to do a fade i just want to do a slick back you know you're excited and you might overlook it but it's something that i've always kind of personally been quite sort of obsessed with so yeah it, it trickles into this really nicely which is great um i'll talk about my sort of like processes as i walk through with how i clean my tools and stuff like that but everything is laid out now ready to go for the day so brownie when you say uh covid is uh implicated you in hygiene do you find that a lot of your hygiene practices in the shop enabled you to really ease into those covid restrictions or did you feel as though you had to make some big changes when when covid hit yeah 100 percent. i mean we all had to adapt a, a, at least a little bit but there was a lot that came in the government guidance for me that is already good practice so wash your hands between every client something we should be doing anyway um making sure that you know you disinfect your work surfaces and you disinfect anything that has contact with the client is something that we should be doing as barbers or hairdressers anyway so there's a lot of things that i was kind of like oh yeah we already do that we already do that what can we do further to that so yeah i mean yeah. it was down to the fact that we steam a gown between every use and then at the end of the day it goes in the washing machine um a little bit of a sustainability thing for me cuts down on single-use plastics because again that was the guidance was a clean gown for every person people chose disposable or people chose to clean them um so yeah i mean yeah, we adapted as best we could and it obviously cost us all a lot of money and a lot of time in getting prepped. And, you know, we never had a hand sanitizer pump at the door, but now we do. And I think that'll stay forever. So, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the way we at Uppercut Deluxe do a haircut, the first kind of few steps, we're not going to touch the tools. There's no, what's the first tool we're going to use? Clipper. What's the first tool we're going to use? Scissors. And like I said before, this for me is all about client retention. I've got to make Eugene want to come and sit in this chair in three or four weeks time. So the first tool for me, every single haircut, every single customer is always consultation uh, and something we also call the design process um, or the design stage. You can call it consultation, you can call it design, whatever you feel comfortable with. So client retention is all about Eugene's got to be happy with his haircut. I need to be happy with Eugene's haircut. Eugene's haircut has to look awesome while he's not in the shop because it's a great advert for a barber to have someone out with a nice haircut that's perfectly styled as a billboard for your work. I need to find out what that haircut is. I could look at Eugene's hair and go through myself and say, I think this is the perfect haircut for Eugene's hair type, head shape, face shape, uh, hair color. But I need to learn a little bit about Eugene, about his lifestyle, 
about his job. Um, so I'm actually going to do a sort of like a short dummy consultation with you today. The strange thing is I already know everything there is to know about Eugene, things that we won't share live on the internet. But, <laughs> um, so yeah, um, the first thing I always ask, and a lot of people kind of might find this strange, a lot of people might go like, oh yeah, I do that too. So, you know, if, if you think it's strange or you, you do the same thing, like feel free to like dive in the comments and let us know. The first thing I want to know, Eugene, is what do you do for work? Where do you work? What's the environment you work in? What's your job? Um, so I'm office based. Okay, uh, cool. But home at the moment. Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah. All to do with aircraft engineering. Right. Okay. Cool. So I, I'm not sure if the mic will pick up what Eugene's saying. Um, so he said he's office based, um, engineering based work, um, working from home at the moment. But you know, pre-COVID or in the real world would be in an office space. So the reason I ask this is I want to know where's Eugene's haircut going to be day to day. Presumably he's going to be at work or, you know, I would have learned he's not at work during the day. He works at night or, you know, so office space role, presumably during the day. Um, not going to be exposed to the elements. So if he'd said I work outdoors, I'd have had to have a different sort of path for this consultation. So I know he works indoors and um, no, it's not a high sort of strain physical job so he's not going to be sweating he's not going to be running around most of the time um so yeah mentally draining based job computer based office based like i know i can give him something that's going to stay in place all day i don't need to worry about it getting wet or windswept or you know apart from the fact we live in england for the people watching that do all understand but um yeah so the second thing after job i want to know is eugene what what are your hobbies what do you do after work or on a weekend that kind of thing um, so, music, uh, yeah, playing music, uh, watching music, listening to music, yeah, uh, and sport as well. Like okay. What kind of sport? Um, what's, your, what's your sort of go to? You're gonna go and be football. active. Okay, so football. you play football as play well. Football, watch, run. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So somewhat physically active. I can tell by your glorious physique, mate. <laughs> um, so yeah, music. I'm getting to know a lot about Eugene now. So I'm like, okay. So I start to build this design of Eugene in my mind. He works in an office during the day. He likes to kind of either play music or go to shows at night and play sport on the weekends. So I need to start putting all of this into the pot of Eugene's perfect haircut. That's what this consultation is all about. It's not necessarily for me to find out exactly what haircut Eugene wants, but to find out what haircut Eugene doesn't want. So that's where all of this information is going. So I know I can give him something that's he could spend Sometime styling in the morning and it's going to hold up for the day at work because he's not going to be outside but something when he does sort of choose to be active is still going to be manageable um so no i'm this could go on for a long time and one of the things i've always said i do 45 minute appointments for a haircut so i could spend 45 minutes on the tools and give haircut a or i could spend 15 minutes discussing the haircut with the client and half an hour on the tools and give a better haircut because it's going to have more information. It's going to be more custom fit for Eugene's lifestyle, his sort of like skill level of styling and that kind of thing. So I've always said, if you've got time to spend on the consultation or the tools, put the tools away. Let's figure out exactly what we're going to do. Sometimes it can go on for half an hour. Um, at that point, you may be going a little bit too far. So um I'd go down the route of, you know, like what kind of music do you like? So I can kind of get an idea of more of an aesthetic. I'll look at what people are wearing when they come through the door. So like I spotted today, like Eugene, he's got like a nice Western style Levi's denim shirt on. Don't miss a trick. Um, <laughs> I'm starting to build a profile of work life, lifestyle life, um, sort of like fashion, because presumably why Eugene's here is he wants a nice haircut. He wants a little bit of advice. Um, I'm not here to tell him what haircut to have, but we'll figure out together. Um, what's perfect for Eugene. So the reason I've asked Eugene to come in for our first ever classic session is his aesthetic fits the classic 1950s barbershop, slick, shiny, smart, smooth, comb-lined, pompadour, slick back, bit of sideburn. I'm starting to build this sort of image of Eugene in his perfect haircut and it fits well with how he dresses. It fits well with the music he listens to, the music he plays but I want to make sure it's something that's going to be manageable when he's playing sport or he's running. It's not going to be in his eyes or, you know, and further down the line, we'll also figure out what product is going to fit that lifestyle perfectly. There's something in the Uppercut Deluxe range that will fit every lifestyle, whether it be 
water-based so it washes out easily or oil-based so it doesn't come out when you're out running in the rain or working out in the elements etc etc so we'll go through a little bit of uh, a little bit more of that after so all just of this information on, Brownie, we've hit just me. had someone ask if this will be uh, on the channel live for watching back so we'll just let them know that the, this uh I'll let you say that <laughs> yeah. Riley's got um, your info. Won't be straight up on the channel, but will be down the line. Uh, won't be up uh, as soon as we finish, but uh, keep an eye on the channel for updates because we'll look at to get it up as as soon as we can. Yeah, of course. And like Riley said, this is the f this is the first time we've had one of these go public. So um, yeah, it probably will be available to watch after, but not immediately because we're not one hundred percent sure on how long it's going to be, how long it'll take to upload, because we'll have to like make sure it processes properly and stuff after. Um, but yeah, it will be available to watch at some point in the future. Cool. All right. Yeah. Sorry to jump on you like that. No, it's all good, man. Ready to go? Yeah, so I was just finishing up kind of talking about the consultation. What am I going to do with this information? So for me, I've sort of discussed with Eugene what you might want. Um, as I've done this a million times with Eugene, I'm just going to go through the style of haircut that I'm going to do um, before we move to the next step. So... We're going to go for a nice, classic, slick pompadour for Eugene. So something really square in the sort of profile looking from the front. Something with a nice square silhouette so that we've got a nice level square top. And I'm going to explain how I'll achieve all of these uh, sort of things. Something that's short on the sides, but not too short because we want to stay in the classics realm to fit Eugene's aesthetic, to fit his lifestyle, to fit, you know, this perfect image of Eugene that we've got. A skin fade isn't going to work here. Um, skin fades were not a thing in the 1950s or in that kind of classic barber shop. That's what we're going for. So yeah, that leads me on to the next step for me, which is step two, uh, which we call mental blueprint. So I'm pretty sure this is the final step of me talking before we actually do some cutting of the hair. So um, the mental blueprint for me is what do we do with all this information? We've found out loads about Eugene. We've decided between us what haircut we're going to do. We've decided usually what products we're going to use, how we're going to style it. And I'll again, I'll go over that towards the end when we're picking out a product and we're going to style the hair. We need to create a mental blueprint. So as I started saying for, I'm just going to spin you around a little bit, Eugene, if that's all right, mate. So as me saying before, some sort of like nice square shape I'm going to go for everything and you can see i'm starting to draw lines with my hands and i'm going to explain why i'm doing that classic haircuts are all about square square on the sides square on the top um you can kind of see the remnants of one of eugene's previous haircuts here luckily it's grown out good enough for this um so yeah the mental blueprint is all about and i've got the design i know what i want this to look like now we need the blueprint so very much like building a house or a building you would sit down, you'd discuss, okay, what do we want it to look like? What are we going to build it out of, et cetera, et cetera. This is where we create that, that plan. So I know I want it square. When we look at it from the front or the back, both on the top and on the sides, I know we want it to look slick and I know we want it to look old school. It's going to be a nice little bit of a nod to our upper looks heritage. So I'm literally starting to draw a plan of how's the finished haircut going to look? How's the haircut going to look if I pull every hair out at 90 degrees? So with it being square, finished on the top and higher at the front, I'll start to draw a mental blueprint of if it's going to be higher at the front, which we're going to do today. We want to elevate that front layer and graduate shorter towards the back. So this all starts to become a part of my mental blueprint and projecting in my imagination, how am I going to achieve the haircut to get the best haircut we can do? And that's how we go from consultation into actually doing the haircut and I'll talk through each step as I'm doing it how that kind of falls into the um the mental blueprint if you will some little nods to uh the classic session that we're doing today along with the elevated front and graduated sort of layering on the top we're going to keep to all of the classic rules of barbering we're not going to come up past the occipital bone with the clipper work because we want to maintain as much flow and as much sort of timeless style as we can. So that'll lead me into my next part and we get to use some tools now, which I'm sure you'll all be very excited about. So the next step, step three, is foundations. So again, this session is very much built on 
we're building something from the ground up. This haircut didn't exist before Eugene sat in this chair. So foundations is the next step. We've designed it. We've figured out how we're going to build it. Now we need to lay the foundations for the building process. So I'm just going to spray the hair down wet um, just to make it a little easier to work with, with my comb. And I can start using my uh, foundations to build sections. So I'm just spraying the top down. And we're going to break the hair down into three main sections. So the foundations for me are the top, the back and sides, and then the transition. So the transition period, the uh, transition sort of part of the haircut is how do we go from the back and sides to the top? So I'm going to go through each of those things, but first I'll lay these foundations ready to tackle each section and I'll break it down. Show you how I'm going to cut the top, show you how I'm going to cut the transition, show you how I'm going to cut the back and sides. So you can see I'm starting to push the hair in the direction that we are going for. So like I explained, we're going to go do a nice classic timeless pomp for Eugene. The back and sides are short already, so we'll, we're going to do a bit of clip work on the sides. Pompadour could be, you know, fully scissor cut or with a nice sort of light little taper on the back and sides. So being short and Eugene's sort of professional job role. We want to give him something nice and clean cut. So now the hair's wet. I'm trying really hard not to spray the camera also because it's on a tripod right next to Eugene's head. So No, it doesn't even. It's all good there, man. I was just being super careful. So yeah, like I said, I want to figure out where's the top, where's the sides, and how do we go between them with that transition. So I'm just going to spin Eugene's camera for this. Cool. So normally I'd do this in the mirror. So you'll see what I see. So I'm combing the hair back in the direction of the finished style, which is going to be towards me, towards the back of the haircut. And I'm just going to start to look for any growth patterns, anything that might cause me any kind of trouble. I'm assessing his hair type, how much there is of it, if any of it's stubborn. Eugene's crown's a delight to work with, so we don't have any trouble there. And as we go, I'm just going to start looking at the sections of the top and the transition and the back and sides. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to flip the top out of the way. When I find the top section, and like I said, I normally do this in the mirror, I look for the front corner of the hairline, and from there, just follow it back up towards the crown. And again, this is easier when the hair's wet. And I start to create that top section so I can uh, partition that away and worry about it after. So again, this is just laying foundations for, it doesn't specifically fall into fading or scissor cutting or anything, but it's all an important part of the process. And I like to break everything down into steps when I'm working mentally. Uh, just compartmentalize a little bit, makes it a bit easier to manage. So like I said, I'm just going to clip the top out of the way. So we've got parting on this side. I'm actually going to spin him back to the uh, mirror because it's really hard without the mirror. So we'll go this way now. How are you getting on over there, Riley? You okay, buddy? All good. Good, man. So again, just looking for that natural parting in that corner of the hair. Do you ever call upon, can you ever notice uh, where those parts are from previous cuts? Only or do you always follow the same rules? I always follow the same rules just because I like to have, um, and I mean this, this process of, you know, each step that we're telling you now, this is how I tackle every haircut, whether it's someone that's new, whether it's someone that's sat in my chair for 10 years, this is how I do it every single time. Because I find that that consistency just gives me a nice consistent finish. Um, you know, you get way more confident when you've like you. I've, how many times do you think we've cut your hair? Probably close to a hundred, maybe. Um, you probably do a freebie, to be fair. So, <laughs> um, but you know, you become familiar. But I'm of the opinion that every time it could be a little bit better. So I go through these these steps, and I always look for something that I go like, oh, you know, I wouldn't have seen that if I didn't use this this method so no shortcuts eh? no shortcuts and i mean the only bit that ever becomes easier and sort of shorter is the consultation stage 
if you nail that the first time someone sits in your chair, you can potentially have that client for life. And, you know, you'll you'll find through process of elimination sometimes that they actually didn't know what haircut they wanted at all and you help them figure that out. But when they've sat in your chair 20, 30 times, you know, they might go, oh, I've seen something different and I fancy a change. Boom, back to consultation, you know, and that's it's one of the things that barbers always kind of go like, oh, like what's new? It's, you know, it's a way to engage that conversation. But again, I go through these steps every single time I do a haircut. I just like to have that meth methodical approach. So now I've got my foundations down. And some real tools. So it brings me on. Step four, the back and sides. I'm just going to blast Eugene's hair dry below those partings just so I've got a nice dry hair to work with the clipper. It'll only take me a second. Um, so excuse the noise of the hair dryer. Shoot us a note in the chat box if uh, you can hear us with the hair dryer going. How's the mic? Let us know if there's any hearing difficulties, any sound difficulties. Just got a question from yeah. the boy Adam Bates. Adam Bates, around, hello Adam. He's just asking, what's that spray bottle there? Spray bottle with the that I used to spray the hair down. Mm. Um, this is, uh, I had to buy the bottle and the pump separately. I broke my, so this is my makeshift Uppercut Deluxe sticker bottle with some Dickies and some uh, Hutto's Barbershop. Uh, stickers, but yeah, I just got I just got the nozzle on eBay and I found a bottle that fits it. It's a bit of a hybrid. I don't really know where you could buy it from, so sorry, I can't be more help, Adam. <laughs> it's a bit of a Frankenstein. He'll make you one for a thousand pounds. Yeah, they are for sale in the uh, Northwest Barbaco merchandise store, <laughs> and we'll do a split commission with Upcut Deluxe and Eugene, of course, Eugene. <laughs> so yeah, as we as we sort of discussed, uh, back and sides next. So the reason that I sprayed and then dried the hair down is I find everything I want to do, like I was explaining about the hygiene, I want everything to be precise, I want everything to be clean. So I always, if I'm parting hair or I'm creating any kind of sections, the hair's always wet. It might seem a little bit counterproductive to spray the hair wet and then dry it, but I haven't dried the whole thing. The top section still works. I'm going to come back to that and spray it down again after. Um, that was just to kind of emulate the sort of like freshly washed shampooed hair ready to work with. I'd always dry the back and sides before I do clipper work. So back and sides, I'm going to use uh, my trusty old wall uh, magic clip cordless available through all great clipper stores I'm not sponsored by wall I'm not sponsored by any of the uh, brands that we're using tonight um, this is just my preference stuff that works for me at the moment we might do this again in a month and I might be using something different so so yeah as we explained before I want a really clean square classic old school traditional finish so i'm not going to go too short on the back and sides i'm probably going to go down to a number one and then taper out the neck um do you want to keep the sideburns as they are but in keeping with the rest of the clipper work so if we do a number one on the haircut i'll get the sides down to a number one as well yeah you don't want me to take them off cool again part of the consultation i don't want to assume or presume anything about how he wants his hair we've you know we've tried it without the sideburns once and it wasn't as good so the sideburns are staying and um, so i'm going to do a number one i'll talk you through each step um and i'll make sure i'm to camera for each step so i always pick one side of the head and work all the way around the head so i'm going to start with number one guard and put that bottom line in so here we go number one um as i'm explaining my clipper work if i reference a uh, closed blade fully closed if I reference an open blade, I always open my blade up as far as it can go and knock it back just a tiny bit. Um, if you're experienced watching this, you might do the same thing. I've always found if it's fully open, it doesn't quite catch the hair just as well. Just knock it back just a little bit until you can see the blade start to move. So closed or open. And if I'm going anywhere in between, I'll explain. So I'm going to start with a closed number one blade. Um, 
And this is a little nugget that is uh, free on top of what we're going to do tonight. I always use my comb to just kind of like move the uh, mask up and down if I'm working with the sideburns, because usually the sideburns come down to sort of like his uh, cheekbone, if you will. I'll probably work above the mask for now, and then we'll remove that strap after. So working with the number one, I'm going to start removing this bulk around the bottom of the haircut. And again, just moving slowly up. Always, I'm, I'm presuming people can hear me pretty well with this uh, clipper running. Um, if you have any audio difficulties with the clipper running, please just let me know. Um, we want to keep a really square shape, so I'm not going to fight against the shape of the head. I'm going to let Eugene's head do the work. I'm just here with the clipper to remove the hair. So as we work up, we'll start to feel what's called the, uh, the P ridge or the Parishial ridge, or people say it differently. I don't want to follow the curvature of the head. I want to obey what the head is telling me. Classic haircuts are all about following the rules. If we were going to do something modern, we could break that rule and go up towards the parting and do something really tight. But we're staying old school, we're staying classic, we're following the rules. So when the hair, not a lot of pressure on the clipper, when the head starts to fight against me, I'm just going to let pull the clipper away, let the head do the talking. And you know, when I'm just doing this number one around the bottom, it's not, not even that high. But I never ever want to go past that past that, it's the widest part of the skull, the widest part of the head. So like I said, I'm going to start on this right side, start removing this bulk around the bottom. I'm not too worried about the edges because I'm going to use the detail to clean those up at the end. But yeah, I can feel it here, the, just work with that head shape. And as I come down towards the back, where the occipital bone is, or the O bone as I'll probably call it for most of the session, just obeying that shape not fighting against it, never going to push the clipper that way. If it wants to come away, I'm just going to let it come away. And that's how I create these guidelines. I'm not measuring a distance, I'm not using sort of like an amount of fingers width, I'm just letting the skull guide that clipper. You can see there, never going to go higher than that. And that's the fundamentals of a, a classic haircut for us. Obey the head shape, never go past the occipital bone with that shortest guard. So if we were doing a zero, same rule applies. I'm never going to go past the occipital bone. If I'm using a one, same rule applies. You can uh, you can change up the, the length or the grade, but I'm always going to use the same rule. I'm starting to fight the occipital bone there. And I'm not using the comb to push the hair into the clipper. I'm just using it to just make sure I don't go past that occipital bone so while I'm feeling it with my right hand feeling it with my left hand as well just giving myself that comfort blanket that I know I can't go past that bone because once we go past there we start to go into sort of like more modern more creative uh, more sort of like art led haircuts and that's not what we're here for today and this was my background in in barbering really is in 2013 I opened my own shop and at that point there was only really a couple of uh, a couple of sort of barber shops that I would have really liked to work in and they were either in London or Brighton a very long way away or France so do you think the scene's come a long way since then yeah 100% I mean there was a huge boom in 2014 2015 uh, at which point I started with the brand um, but you know, when I started out, everything was classic, everything was old school, everyone wanted a really cool, old fashioned, slick, smart haircut. And you know, I've kind of watched skin fades grow and uh, cropped fringes grow, and I know a lot of that kind of comes from the sort of like punk rock eras, which again, I'm, I'm quite influenced by, but at that time, the old school barbershop all about good service making sure your customers are having a good time making sure the atmosphere is enjoyable and it all kind of flowed into that haircut it's not a creative outlet it's not art it's not you know imagination it's rules it's tradition and there's just something charming about that and i think why a lot of the uppercut barbers kind of ended up where they are now, you know, like the other ambassadors around the world is 
they love and respect that blue collar work. We're service providers, we're here to do a good job and we're here to make sure that Eugene's happy. So following these rules is going to make sure we do that. Eugene's not asked me to create something ridiculous or out there or shocking. Maybe one day, but not today. So again, not going any higher than that with the number one guard. And I'm not overly precious about how crisp that line is right now because I'm going to go over it a little bit after. So as I was discussing earlier, the difference between the back and sides and the transition. The back and sides is everything that falls onto the head. If I put my comb onto the side of the head, 90 degrees, I'll probably do it this way, you might see a little better. Yeah, there we go. So if I put my comb on top of the ear, 90 degrees to the ground, everything that's touching the comb is the back and sides. Everything between the comb and the parting, I'm going to call the transition. So again, 90 degrees from the top of the ear, that's the silhouette I'm chasing. So everything that touches the comb, and you can't because he's head overgrown, generally pops around there. So that's where I'm going to use as a template for my next weight line. So I'm now going to use a closed number three. So I always work in a rule of two. Um, started with a number one because that's how short we decided to go on the back and sides. I'm never going to use more than the rule of three. So if I decide to do a zero back and sides, rule of two, I'll never go higher than a two guard. If I use a number one, I'll never go higher than a three guard. If I go longer than anything, number three, I'll just use scissors. So again, following the head shape, and that square 90 degree from the ground rule I'm going to use that top contact point again pulling away not fighting what the clip will do just square 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 and that gives me my back and sides workspace so everything between the three and everything between the one I'm going to blend out using another clipper guards and then I'm going to cut the transition with either clipper over comb or scissor over comb. So yeah, as I said, this is a close three and I'm just hitting that top line, pulling away once the clipper starts to fight and I hit that top contact point. So you'll start to see it a little clearer now. Everything touching the clipper, uh, everything touching the comb is going to get touched with the clipper. Everything above it, I'm leaving for later. So, again, I'm not too precious about how clean this weight line is at the top because that's all going to get cut off after anyway. So, I don't want to waste time, I want to be efficient. And the same rule is going to apply around the back. I'm just going to go square, pull away. As soon as the contact starts to leave, I'm not going to chase it. And this is something that it took me a long time to get my head around when I was training, you know. You'll start to learn things like head shape and where you should be going, where you shouldn't be going in regards of traditional barbering. And this is all within the realms of this is acceptable, this is correct, this is right. Back to old hairdressing literature from the sort of 50s. There's nothing in it that isn't square, everything is square, slick, shiny, and I think that's what inspired the man Steve Purcell to start this brand and create a product that can kind of sit in line with that. So come around to you now, Riley, and I'll cut on that side. So yeah, just repeating the same process on the other side. Just creating that nice square profile. Remove this bulk get it out of the way and starting to prep my transition for when we're going to cut that because the transitions where this haircut's going to either make or break we can cut the back and sides nice we can cut the top nice if they don't if they don't flow right and they don't work together we're absolutely wasting our time and again this step zero hygiene always kicking in if I've got hair on my clippers and it starts to build up I just want to get rid of that if I've got a lot of hair on the client starts to build up I want to get rid of that it just helps me stay in the zone and these are the things that a client's going to spot 
that might make or break him coming back. So Yuji might go, oh yeah, and normally get really itchy when I get my hair cut, but that didn't happen here. Or, you know, like, oh, the guy's tools are always really hairy, you know, as, as barbers, it's down to us to keep that, keep that business coming in, paying our bills, and all of these little, little nuggets of things I've picked up along the way. And how we ended up developing this course together, right, Riley? That is correct. That is correct. So these education seminars on YouTube are going to become a regular thing over time. So we've got some more in the pipeline. Dates will be announced soon. Mm. This is the classics session for anyone that's just joining us. Feel free to drop in the chat box what you'd like to see more of. or Yeah, for sure. Any... Uh, any requests or hey look at that i've took a mask off that's the first time that's ever happened and of course it's happened when we're live on the internet <laughs> eugene i've got a nice new one for you do you know what when we um when we did there you go buddy i'll let you uh dispose of the old one when we did the uh first test of this live streaming setup we had uh, a guy called michael in the chair hi michael um and I was telling a story about how I've never ever cut a disposable mask off. I've only ever cut an expensive Adidas filtering <laughs> mask. And someone in, I can't remember, it might have been Adam, it was one of the UCDC boys said, oh, how many masks have you cut off? And I was like, I've never cut off. Here we are. It's done. It's happened. It's because I'm focusing so hard on uh, being hygienic. So, yeah. You can start to see that square shape really form now, and I'm not cre I've not created a harsh weight line at the bottom with that number one by allowing the clipper to just come away from the head. If we went in, stopped, in, stopped, you'd create a really solid line. I've started to feather that out already, so just making my job a little easier. So I'm just gonna check the symmetry in the mirror, and again, this is a symmetrical haircut, so. I'm always referencing in the mirror, I'm like, is my work still symmetrical? Am I still in the right ballpark? And no one's head's ever perfectly symmetrical, so, you know, you can only get so many millimetres accuracy. That looks pretty good. And creating this symmetrical shape now is going to lend well to when I decide to cut the top and how I'm going to cut the top. So I'm going to move now from my cloak 3 to one point. Just got the hair out of there, and you know, you your haircuts are only as sharp as your tools. Really, if you look after your tools, they're going to look after you. So, I'm always getting any little hairs that are in there stuck, just so they're not abrasive, they're not causing any damage. So, yeah, 1.5. Um, just a, I think it's a, I think they're called the premium guards. 1.5 premium guard. So, again, closed or open. I'm going to start with an open blade on this one. So this is the first open blade I've used. So I've got a number one at the bottom and a number three at the top, which only leaves me a number two or a number 1.5 in the middle. If we're working in sort of like closed guard settings, I can go between a 1.5 closed and a 1.5 open and remove this line. So that's what I'm going to work on doing now. So again, open, just... Fully open, notch back tiny, just a millimetre or so. Shift. And I'm just going to start working on removing this line. Just really soft and gentle. Again, working with the head shape, not biting it. Trying really hard not to cut this mask off. Oh, I can't believe that's happened, that's brilliant. <laughs> it's Murphy's Law right now. Of course, yeah, and I mean, how, what, we're well over a year deep into this pandemic now. That's the first disposable mask I've ever gone through. I love it. We'll tell this story for years to come, Eugene. Yeah, what you don't know is I put a little nick in it earlier. Yeah, I bet you player. did. Riley, you pesky boy. <laughs> like Riley was kind of explaining in his intro earlier, we've worked for about 12 months to develop this streaming setup and platform and the courses, and there's a lot more to come, you know. We're, we're keeping a few cards kind of like close to our chest because there's some really exciting course content to come um, so while we're doing classics tonight there's other stuff that's in the pipeline that's in the works but the last 12 months has been a strange 12 months like Riley said with the 
adapting to being COVID secure and you know we've only had so many hours to work together on getting this off the ground so we appreciate every single one of you that's watching this because it really is a labour of the last 12 months in very difficult circumstances. We're really proud of how far we've taken our education platform and we really can't wait to, to get more of it out in the public. And, you know, this is really only the start, isn't it, Brownie, of what we've got to come, which is really exciting. Yeah, of so course. So if there's anything you want to see in, in Uppercut Deluxe, you know, not just virtual education, but, but all education, feel free to drop it in the chat and, and let us know what you'd like to see and, and we'll take it on board. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, pre, pre-COVID... We had a great team of ambassadors traveling the world, cutting hair in you know, every continent and putting out some amazing classes and with the travel restrictions and you know, everything's gonna change from now on and we're a lot more limited with where we can go, who can go to which place and you know, we just have to adapt and figure out how can we get in your get in your space, how can we share knowledge, how can we kind of grow together. So that's what this is all about, right? And this isn't this isn't how you should do this haircut. This is how I do this haircut. The best sessions when you're in a room are when you do something and someone goes, whoa, I've never seen it done like that before. This is how I do it. And you start to exchange and you start to discuss because we're all creative. We've all trained in different places. So this is just my way. But the structure is always the same. I always start. Step zero hygiene. First thing I think about when I walk in the shop. First thing I think about when I'm leaving the shop and I'm cleaning up for the night and I'm locking up. It's always on my mind. And then I go through these fundamental steps. Consultation, create that mental blueprint, start to lay those foundations. So if you're watching and maybe thinking that you would follow steps a different way and you're wondering why why Brownie's gone, gone this way about it, uh, feel free to drop in the chat. Yeah, oh, and ask, ask, ask him why. Yeah, for sure. And if anyone's got any sort of like general questions about my career or barbering or, you know, my tools or preferences or... Well, what do you have for breakfast? Shreddies today, mate. <laughs> shreddies every day. Mm, nice big bowl of shreddies. Can't go wrong. Can't beat shreddies. Again, not sponsored by shreddies. All <laughs> <laughs> well, the cereals are available. So I'm going between a closed and an open blade now. I've worked all the way around with an open blade to start to remove that weight and you can see there's still a very subtle line. So I'm going to go in close now. And where it might not need as much attention, I just release that pressure. I'm not pushing in really hard, just nice light strokes. It might take a little longer, but I'm going to get a cleaner finish. So just use it in the corner of the blade to get in above the ear there. Start to remove that line. So this is a 1.5 guard, my other option would be to be using a 1 guard and open the blade up. I generally do both. So I go over with a close, close 1.5 and then I'll just finish up with a, a 1 guard again. Open it up just to get all those degrees of length. Blend that line completely out. So you can already see it, see it starting to take a, a nice sort of traditional shape. I haven't gone past the occipital bone with my shorts clipper guard, which is the main rule that I wanted to follow when I'm doing a traditional classic haircut. We want to make everything flow from back and sides to top through that transition. And the scissor work's really where this haircut kind of comes to life. The clipper work is uh, kind of a 21st century adaptation really because they didn't have cordless magic clips in uh, the 1950s barbershop. When I was doing my training, um, and you'll probably see this kind of come into action a little bit, I use a lot of scissor over comb in places that a lot of barbers would use clipper over comb. So when I was doing my apprenticeship, uh, the guy that I trained under, Darren, didn't let me use clippers until I could do everything with scissors because the clippers are a tool, they're a gift, they've got a motor, they do the work for us, but he wanted me to understand how to do the work myself. So I had to learn to do all of these haircuts, scissor over comb, before I could even touch a clipper. So once I could uh, do a nice short back and sides with the scissors, I was allowed to try it out with the clipper and I've just kind of amalgamated the two now. I use 
I use clippers where I want precision and I use scissors where I want something a little more natural and a little softer. And that's the best thing about barbering, we create our own style. Someone might cut the back and sides completely differently to me if Eugene went in and asked for this same haircut, went through the same consultation, he might leave with the same haircut but the methods are all so different and that's the beauty of it. Me and Riley were discussing earlier how you can step in a room anywhere in the world and start cutting hair and everyone understands that same language if you can't communicate verbally they can at least watch and take something away from it and like I said earlier this is just my way of doing it so if you take anything away from this that's awesome if you want to send anything my way and say this is how I do it that's awesome I'm available to reach out to in the comments or uh, we're on social media we'll share our uh, handles after so I'm just as I sort of mentioned before I'm just swapping back to a one guard now so one guard and I'm going to flick between open and closed to just get rid of that final tiny little line in the bottom of Eugene's hair and then I'm going to start cutting the transition section next I think Riley right on some barbers at this point might choose to uh, sort of cut the outline with the details and get it all freshened up but I'm going to leave that till the very end so yeah just gauging how much needs to come out of this tiny little weight line fractional changes in how open or how close my guard is and just flick it out again gentle nothing too strict nothing too uh, harsh with my clipper movements and I'm just following that shape of the head let the clipper and the head do the work I'm just here to push it up and down Alrighty. So for now I'm going to leave the back and sides. There's a bit of tidying up to do at the end but we'll get to that when it's time. And again this is how I approach every haircut depending on, you know, obviously if it's a long scissor cut it'll be different but for anything short to mid length I'll follow the exact same, exact same process. So I'm a scissor over comb man, so I'm going to do scissor over comb. Uh, personal choice, 6.5 inch, these are passion I believe, passion scissors, again, not sponsored, just uh, this is my weapon of choice. And a wide tooth cutting comb, there we go. Who makes the comb, is that a Wyatt's Park? Yeah, it's a Wyatt's Park and I learned that they've got model numbers on them. So this is a Wyatt's Park. Ooh, my eyesight's terrible. Not what you want to hear. No. <laughs> three, 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 two. Three, 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 two. Three, 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 two. So, when I'm cutting scissor over comb, I'm going to let the scissors decide which direction I'm going to cut the hair. So, scissors point that way. This is the start. I'm going to follow the scissors all the way to the end. And you could start at the other side. It wouldn't make a huge difference, but... That's just how I've always been taught. Follow the scissors. Nice long blade means I can get plenty of hair on there. Plenty of contact with the comb. So yeah, I'm now going to leave the back and sides and start to cut the transition, which I believe is step five. Right on. So I call this the transition. I'm sorry if some of this seems a little repetitive, but I'm conscious if people are tuning in and you know didn't see it earlier just to keep everyone on the same page. So I call this the transition because we've got the back and sides, we've got the top. How do we get from A to B? We've got to get that transition correct. So some people would choose to just do this with the clipper, clipper over comb or with a clipper guard. Because it's a nice classic old school haircut, I want to maintain as much flow and as much character as possible. So I'm just going to start to push the hair back in the direction of the finished haircut. And I'm going to use that top weight line that I created earlier to lift the hair up, comb out to 45 degrees and just soften that edge. So I just want to continue that square shape. So I've cut up to here with my clipper. Now it's time to just tidy up this transition. 
and the transition is going to be something that we kind of flip between. So I'm going to cut the back and sides. I'm going to cut the transition. I'm going to cut the top to work with the transition. The transition might just need a little bit of fine tuning towards the end. So yeah, so again, this is why I always start this side. I'm going to use my scissors to lift the hair up, create a section, comb goes in underneath into that 45 degrees. So that's why I always start at this side of the hairline. If I start on the other side, I find it's kind of, it just doesn't feel as natural. So I'm going to follow that flow of the scissor with the head. Again, these don't make huge steps to create in a perfect haircut. All of these little things add to a good service. Hopefully going to make Eugene want to come back into the shop and sit in my chair again. And as creative people, we want to be happy with the haircut as well. So Eugene needs to be happy with it. I need to be happy with it. If we smash both of those, it's a job well done. So again, just pushing the hair into that, into that direction, coming back behind the ear, conscious of how it's going to be styled after. And this isn't a huge amount of growth on Eugene's hair. If this was long, I would be spraying the hair wet pulling the hair down, cutting it, uh, club cutting it with the scissor, but because it's already quite short, I'm just going to tweak. And again, I'm using the comb to bounce off the head into that shape. And just work around in smallish sections. And I'm just letting the comb show me what needs to come off by following that rule of coming up to that guideline and coming out at 45 degrees. Anything that's on show is going to get trimmed in. Anything that's behind the comb is safe. It's for another day, does it? It's the one, man. It's not about what you take off, it's about what you leave on. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, just following again, follow the direction of the scissor all the way around the head prep that transition and the transition is important because it's going to give us a cheat cheat code for how to cut the length on the top so we want to make sure we spend the time getting this right because if this is structured and even all the way around the head it's going to make cutting the top twice as fast twice as easy and that will be where we start to see the classic barbershop haircut come to life because the classic haircuts were all about flow and connection. So modern haircuts, you'll see a lot of disconnection. And what I mean by disconnection is short hair next to long hair. There's no graduation between the two. And what I say by connection is where there is a connection. So short hair, if we were to extend everything out from the scalp at 90 degrees, it'd be a nice smooth transition if you were to look at the profile. Classic haircuts are all connected. I mean, there's little parts where you could probably break that rule. If you had a really tall pompadour, it's never going to be 100%. But as a general rule, connected and square, that's where we want to be for a tra traditional classic finish. We've just had someone ask what step you're at, Brownie. Uh, so this is step five, which we transition. So you want to run from step zero through to five again, just to catch them up? Yeah, of course, man. Yeah, so yeah, yeah for anyone that's just tuned in, this is how we always follow our sort of step-by-step -step guide to an uppercut deluxe haircut if you will so how do we do a, an uppercut deluxe classic haircut and the classic uppercut deluxe haircut is anything that you would have found in the 1950s barber shop obviously we've made sort of subtle tweaks to bring it up to date a little bit so step zero is hygiene and we list it as step zero because it is indefinite it never stops and if it doesn't stop, you can't start it. It just happens. It's before the client sits in the chair. It's before you get to work. You take care of yourself. You take care of your workspace and you take care of your tools. And then you take care of your client while they're in the chair. So hygiene is listed as step zero because it's kind of an over overview of the whole thing. So it's not step one. So step one for me, and I'm not just talking about how do we do the perfect haircut for Eugene. I'm trying to create the perfect client experience, but also the perfect client relationship. How do we make sure Eugene keeps coming back, spending money, paying the electricity bill, keeping the lights on so he can keep coming back 
and it's all about service. It's all about client retention. So step one's always consultation. And I think one of the most important things I try and teach is that consultation is a tool. So if you go in a barber shop, what tools have you got? Scissors, combs, clippers, consultation. It's a tool. It's at your disposal to make the haircut right, but also to make it wrong. So that's step one. And then from step one of consultation, we create a mental blueprint. We take everything we learn in the consultation, turn it into a design. And then from there, step three, the foundations lay the foundations for the cut so if there's any uh, any sort of partings to separate back and sides transition and top that's how I always approach a haircut break it down into smaller pieces that are easier to manage so then yeah step four five six back and sides transition and the top you can do in any order it's whatever you feel comfortable with it's whatever feels right on the day it's whatever's gonna you know give you the best experience as a barber Today I chose to do the back and sides, then the transition, and then next we're going to cut the top. So again, that transition section, I'm going to come back and do some tuning to it at the end, but I've kept a square shape throughout, all the way around the head, no matter what angle I look at it, it's nice and square, apart from that bit, it's better. There we go. So yeah, the next step, step six is going to be the top. So there's still a little bit damp, but I'm just going to spray it. Again, try not to spray the camera. So yeah, this is where the haircut's going to come to life. And this is the traditional, traditional barbering, but it's going to be, how do I get to that finished product? How do I create that timeless haircut? So the methods might be a little different to how they would have done them in the sort of the twenties or the fifties or any sort of classic time period for men's fashion and men's style, but we want to create the same look. So I'm going to show you how I cut this. So for anyone that missed the start, we're going for a nice classic pompadour, high at the front, square angle at the front, and then graduated down into a shorter layer at the crown. And we want that to flow seamlessly into the back and sides. So. The occipital bone is our guideline at the back and the hairline is our guide at the front. We need to get from here to here, fully connected, seamlessly, but also with plenty of height at the front, not too much height that it becomes difficult to style. So I'm going to show you how to keep everything proportionate. I would choose how much length is going to be on this haircut. So I'm probably going to spin to you, Riley, now. Good there. Cool. So, combing the hair back in the direction of the finished hairstyle. I'm just going to start to take small sections running parallel with the parting. So, just above the natural parting first. And then I'm just going to comb everything else out of the way. And I always work in sort of small, clean sections when I'm cutting the top. And that's what I mean when I say it might differ to the methods of the sort of traditional barbershop is this is very much men's hairdressing, but this is where men's hair really started to become fashionable. It started to become cool. It started to become its own thing. And that's how we ended up with the barbershops we have today. So just uh, pull Eugene around there. So as I was saying earlier, when I cut the transition, I'm starting my guideline for cutting the top it's going to make this easy proof to an extent as long as i don't cut his mask off again so if i pull this top section down at 90 degrees from the parting and i lift the hair up i can see my guide underneath i can see that transition so this is where i cut with the transition and i can start to see the length that is above so i'm going to pull everything from parting to just past the middle of the head if we were to work in these vertical sections down into this transition so i'm graduating the hair short to long across the head and then by working from the front to the back i'm going to do the same thing so this is going to create my guideline for cutting the top Sorry, so Brandon, did you say did you start on 
bad when you do this? Uh, what, again, whatever feels comfortable. I always start on the right because I like to put my scissors into the hair. But I mean, I'm going to then have to go on to the other side. There isn't mm -hmm. really a hard rule of which side is because I'm going to symmetrically mirror my work on the other side of the head. So I'm choosing to work on the right first. So I'm going to start with this small section. You can see how much hair there is there. If I lift it up again, it's not uh, quite a thin section. So I'm going to pull straight down, following the shape of the head, and I'm going to use the guide of my transition to cut this hair. So start here, that's one, and again I just break it down into sort of smaller pieces, scissors to show my guide line underneath, two, scissors will show my guide line underneath, that's three. So my section above now follows the shape of that transition section. I missed one. There he is. So again, I'm going to work from the path into just past the middle of the head, and then I'm going to spin the chair around and do exactly the same on the other side. And you can work in whichever sort of size sections you feel comfortable with doing, really. So I usually use about a finger's width at a time. So again, just push everything I don't need out of the way. Flip my comb around to the finer. That's something I like to do is I use a fine tooth comb when I'm cutting as well. So I can see I can see my guide underneath and see what needs to come down into that guide. So again, straight down 90 degrees from the parting. Not too much tension, but enough to give a nice clean cut into that guide line. And I, I'm all always checking for my guideline with the scissors. I know it's there. I've cut this haircut on Eugene's head a hundred times before, but I check every single time. I want to be certain, I want to be sure. And just in case you kind of missed what I said earlier, I'm graduating from short to long across the head, and I'm going to graduate from long to short from the back to the front. So the hair from point A to point B here will be this long, and point A to point B here will be this long, it's going to be longer in the middle than it is on the sides for now. So again, just check how far I am away from the middle. Head back. And when I'm parting, I use my thumb on the end of the comb to put a little bit of tension down on the scalp. Keep my thumb in place. And that's going to give me that clean section. I want to work with right there. So again, straight down into that. Transition section, I can see my guide underneath. Just work all the way across to the middle of the head. And this is kind of a hard and fast rule for creating the perfect proportions for this style of pompadour. So, like I said, I've done it a bunch of times on Eugene, but this rule can be applied to any head. If you want a pompadour that is longer at the front and shorter towards the crown, this is how I'll always cut it. So again, nice sort of small vertical sections from the hairline back, comb that out of the way. I always find that clean sections help to create a clean finished haircut. So I'm always quite particular with pulling these in and out. And it takes a little longer again, but I'm saving time by following these kind of hard and fast rules of if I do A, B, C, one, two, three, it's going to take me the same amount of time as long as I uh, follow those rules. And this is just the first part of cutting the top. So now that I've reached the middle, I'm going to spin the chair, do exactly the same on the other side. And once I've done this, variations on it, if you will, but I'll just repeat, I'll repeat myself on this side in case any of that didn't make sense for people that maybe aren't as experienced watching this or kind of couldn't quite see on the other side. Just keeping the hair nice and wet, it's a little easier to manipulate. Pushing it back into the finished sort of style. So again, I started at the corner of the hairline, I'm going to go about a finger's width above. 
straight back. And even if there's not an awful lot there to cut, because I'm guessing you cut this at home last time, right? I did. Yeah, it's not a bad job. I've seen worse. So again, there's not a huge amount there, but I can see my guide underneath. I just want to match that with this section. You got Charlie Van showing you some love in the chat. It does a great job, Randy. Thanks, man. I take quite a lot of influence from Charlie's work, so if uh, anyone's watching, he's well worth a look. He knocks out a few nice classics every now and again. It's not averse to a classic cut. Not averse to a classic cut. And that's the cool thing, you know, like me and Charlie met through Instagram and hit it off and we exchanged tips, we exchanged stories. I mean, we've met up at a few conventions and had a couple of uh, parties, as the kids say. <laughs> but, you know, these this community really is just an amazing little community full of creative folk that want to share and learn and grow. And Charlie could knock out a much nicer haircut than this, but, you know, he's still sat there watching and I'd do the same if he was doing a, a haircut. And we've actually tuned into some of the same stuff online before when Steve Purcell did a flat top and it was four o'clock in the morning, me and Charlie were there. So again, you can see there's not as much hair to come off this side, but that's only down to the fact that COVID meant that Eugene couldn't get his hair cut for four months. But I'm going to hazard a guess, needed to look smart for Zoom calls, right? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes a home haircut's better than no haircut. Sometimes no haircut's better than a home haircut. Depends who you live with. So yeah, I've just reached the middle of the hair there. So I'm going to show what that's had on the layers on the top. It's had some squats in the sprayer. Is it just water, Brian? Yeah, at the moment, just water, yeah. Just nice Good and simple. Good old H2O. That's it. Yeah, some people will put sort of like pre-styling stuff in there, but um, I'm going to go over like product choice and what's that, what I'm going to put in there after. So... I'm going to spin to you now, uh, Riley. don't want to knock you out there, dude. So, by cutting the hair and graduating it from the sides into the middle in that direction, I'll just comb it down so you can see it from the front. And again, this is all, it's part of my mental blueprint, which was step two, I believe. So, this comes down into there, as I said, the hair from here to here is X, and from here is obviously longer. So if I'm to lift this hair up now at 90 degrees from the scalp, you'll see it's shorter on this side, longer in the middle. So by doing that, I've created a guideline that's going to give me a foolproof guide for cutting the perfect length for this haircut on top. Everything's going to be fully proportionate. It's going to be fully connected. This is where you could make the choice to overextend the front. And what I mean by overextension is when I was cutting this section here, and I'll just show you before I lift it up again. This section, I'm only just doing this loosely. This section on the right is shorter. It might be all left. In the middle, it's longer because I chose to pull down in this direction and cut and graduate the hair. If I was to do the exact same thing, but pull this past that transition section further down, the same rule would apply, but the hair would in fact be longer. So when we pull it up at 90 degrees from the scalp, we could get longer hair at the front, create a higher pompadour. But for the reasons I discussed, we're going we're going classic, we're going old school. I'm going to make sure all of this matches up and is connected perfectly throughout. So I'm going to use, let me just pull this over here just for demonstration. This isn't how I'll cut the top at the moment, but just so you can kind of see what I'm talking about. All that work I've put into cutting that top section has given me a guide on this corner and given me a guide on this corner and I want to connect them. So I want a nice square layer on the top. How long is it going to be? The transition is going to tell me. So I'm going to find that corner and I'm going to connect it to the other corner and I'm going to work all the way back, do exactly the same thing. So I will, I'll keep you to the camera actually. I generally start at the front when I'm doing this. But you could start at the back. It wouldn't really make a difference because the guide's going to be exactly the same no matter where you choose to go. So if I was to pull this section in the middle 
I've got a guide here from pulling it down, cutting it into the transition. It's longer in the middle and I've got a guide here. So again, I want to connect those, connect those dots. So I'm just going to work back in small sections from the front to the back to keep the hair moist while I'm doing it. And I'm not going to pull all of the hair out at 90 degrees from the scalp because we're going in this direction. I want the front to be longer, I want the back to be shorter. So if I was to cut this at 90 degrees, I'd be pulling it forward, but I'm going to keep it in the direction of the finished haircut. So I'm going to pull it back and up. Here's my guide. I'm going to go square across one, continue that line, and again. I'm working square with the head and I'm going to find that dot on the other side. One, two, and three. And that's how I'll always pick the length for doing this version of a pompadour. And you can start to see there's the guide that I've cut at the top, at the front, and I now need to work that back all the way through the hair. You could also choose at this point, which a lot of the time I'll do, to cut uh, what we call a profile section. So you could take a section down the middle of the hair follow this guide from the front at 90 degrees to your original section and flow back. But just for the ease of this, I'm just going to keep following A to B, A to B, A to B. But I'm also introducing another guide now because I've got the guide from my previous section. So just work in small sections. I'm going to comb my last section into my new section. I'm going to look for my guide on the right hand side and I'm going to look for my guide at the front. So I've got hair that needs cutting, hair from my previous section, hair from my transition section. I can't get it wrong. Follow that rule every single time. All the way across, front to back. And the more confident you get, the bigger your sections can become, but I just like to work in sort of small sections. And as I said before, the higher this becomes and the longer it is, the more height in the finished haircut starts to begin to get a bit more difficult to style etc so again another small section coming back take my last section put it into my new section straight up i have a guide there guide on the right and following these rules it might sound repetitive but it really is repetition you know, you're just painting by numbers. If you put the groundwork in early on, you can just work your way through. The difficult thing with this is, as well as consultation, my second favourite tool is the mirror, and I'm not cutting with a mirror at the moment, so I'm going to spin around to the chair in a sec, Riley, and you can kind of watch from the side if you like. Right on. And again, the mirror is just giving me that final confirmation that I'm not going past my previous guidelines. So if we go side on, you can start to see the cut hair and the overgrown hair, which is beginning to form. And I'm using all that cut hair as a guide. So again, section across the top, take part of the previous section, nice new section, cut across square layers. And I usually watch in the mirror when I'm cutting. Because I can see where the hair gets longer, I can see my previous guide in the mirror. And this is something that a, anyone in America watching might think is sort of strange because I, I know I got my hair cut at Brass Tacks in Texas. And it was awesome because they spin you around and they cut the whole thing with your back to the mirror. So when you've had your hair cut, you spin around and you've got a nice fresh finished haircut but I like to face the mirror because I use it as a tool so I'm not saying one's right and one's wrong but for me I just always feel comfortable because I can see what's square I can see the angle of Eugene's head I can see my previous layer I can see if I'm going too short I can see if I'm going too long I can see the hair up against my shirt kind of use that contrast 
And again, it's all in that mental blueprint. You draw all of these little steps one at a time. And I know I can't get it wrong because I'm using the guides. So once I start to get towards the back, I start to just check across the head to check it's square. Check if I've missed any little sort of touches. So again, I'll do this side. 90 degrees from the ground, square layer. Just cross checking to see if anything in there has been missed. Line up one. Again, it takes a few more seconds, but it's going to give you a better finish. And you can start to see the shape come into life a little bit now. I just have the back half to finish cutting. This is where sometimes it becomes beneficial to cut a little profile section in, so I'm going to do that now. I'm just going to take a finger's width down the middle and connect it from front to back. So I've got a third guide. I've got the guide from the transition. I've got the guide from the front section. I'll go this way so you can see. And I'll now have a guide in the middle. So again, square. And I'm going to start to follow the head shape because if we were to continue square from the ground here, we're starting to overextend and graduate into a longer section, which isn't what we want. So I'm going to follow the shape of the head at 90 degrees from the follicle. Just working around to my transition section which is at the bottom and this is the top so I can see there again I know it's correct because I can see I'm connecting the dots so I now can use this as a guide to go this way Eugene's going to be able to knock out a full haircut now you won't need you anymore, Matt. I know, yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to preach client retention and I'm teaching him all the tricks. He's gonna go and do his own thing. He's gonna set up across the street from me. <laughs> oh, he'll just grab the kitchen scissors and knock it out at home in fifteen minutes, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> like I was saying before, like this this is my kind of comfort zone, this is my background, is longer scissor haircuts. So I love this kind of stuff. And you've just got to find what you're comfortable with and if you you know you practice what you preach you'll build that clientele and they'll become loyal and they'll keep coming back so you go from an empty column to a full column that's what it's all about and eugene's kind of proof in the pudding because i've been cutting his hair for a long time in fact eugene's <laughs> eugene's always had a very similar haircut we did a flat top once mm -hmm. didn't we and we went back to this haircut <laughs> Well, you didn't like the flat, flat top, you didn't. I have a flat top. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, you, and you know, you, we've worked really hard to tweak this haircut to be perfect for Eugene's lifestyle and sort of fashion taste. So, you know, we tried something different and it wasn't quite, quite right. So, again, I'm just going to start connecting in small sections from the top down into the transition. And you can see guideline there. Guideline there, just square to the shape of the head. And this is how I always finish cutting this top section. Working in small sections all the way across. And because it's symmetrical, I know I can just keep going 90 degrees from the head all the way around. If it was an asymmetrical haircut, you know, we had like a side parting in there, this would be a really different process. But this is how I always build that foundation for this haircut. And then I'm going to show you my next little trick, which took me quite a long time to learn, to be honest. I think I learned it watching one of the old Uppercut Ambassadors like back in the day. It was quite a long time ago. So I'll just spin Eugene a touch and demonstrate by cutting everything square on the top. I've created quite a harsh front section here. So if this was to get dried and styled you'd probably still be able to see that weight line so i need to do something to just soften that so i'm just going to pull small sections and i'm just going to take that corner off it's not a huge step but it just starts to help that hair flow transition again if this was pulled 
in this direction, it's square. If I pull it forward, you can start to see just a tiny corner. It's only a couple of mil, but it's just going to help the hair stay back. It's going to help it flow a little better. And it's not a big cut. It's not a massive game chip, but it's going to just finish the haircut so nicely. And I could have left that, you know, and saved 30 seconds, but it's just going to make the finished product pop a little better. So again, just a tiny bit there. Just Charlie's just asking if you always do the, always start with the back, start with the sides first, sorry, and then the top. Um, depends on who's in the chair. So my general rule is if I've cut your hair before, I'll cut the back and sides first because I'm comfortable. I know where I'm going. I know your head shape. If I've got someone new in the chair, I'll, I'll decide what's going to be best for the finished style. If I've got someone in that's having quite a lot of hair removed, I'll cut the top first every time. So I cut the back and sides when I can see the back and sides. So Eugene's hair wasn't overgrown to the point that this part of the canvas, if you will, was covered. It was still exposed. I could clearly see my work area. If the hair was overgrown or it was someone with long hair that wanted a restyle, I'd cut the top first and I'd just reverse my process. So I'd cut the top and then I'd use this guide to cut the transition and then I'd use the transition as a guide for hitting with my clipper work. So it's exactly the same process. It's just reversed depending on how much, how much hair is in the, in the way, if you will. So yeah, when it's something I'm familiar with, I always cut the back and sides first. If it's longer hair, I generally cut the top first. And if it's uh, someone new, I'll kind of pick which one's best. I'd be interested to know if uh, Charlie's into that. What does Charlie do? And you know, some people will watch this and say, I always cut the sides first. I always cut the back first. And that's ace. I, you know, each of us have got our way of doing it. Today we just want to sort of demonstrate our steps for a full haircut front to back. You can put those steps in pretty much any order. You're still going to get the same thing at the end. And if Eugene comes back for another haircut and stays in my book, I'm happy. So I'm just checking my work over slightly, see if I've missed anything. It's looking pretty good. So yeah, I'm going to leave the cut in for now and move on to the next section, which I'm going to call this step seven, we're going to call it the blow dry. I'm also going to mash it into a later section, which is styling. They exist together. Um, all of these traditional haircuts with some kind of structure, there's going to be a blow dry. And this is where we secure the shape for the rest of the day. Um, Again, if I'm sort of explaining, I'm trying to explain this for all levels of people that are experienced or maybe people that don't know as much. When your hair's wet, it's malleable. You can push it around. It will go into any shape. So if we were to put Eugene's hair into rollers wet, dry it, it will stay in the curl until it gets wet again. Water resets that purpose of the hair. So we want to dry in that style and dry in that shape and lock it in. So the next thing I'm going to do is blow dry Eugene's hair start to create a shape when the hair's dry. We can move on to the next couple of sections, which are going to be just tweaking any parts of the hair cutting and the styling. So for the purpose of today, I'm not going to use any pre-styling products because I've already picked in my head what I'm going to style this haircut with. And we're going to use the new uppercut clay, but first I'm going to blow dry. So yeah, again, I don't know if, uh, I don't know if people can hear with the hair dryer on. So I'll talk through it a little bit. Hopefully you can. So, this is my trusty Uppercut Deluxe Quiff Roller. It's never died. It used to have a logo on it. I mean, I've this thing's been... Some spent some time yeah, in hand, has it? He's seen some action. It's been all <laughs> over the world with me. Um, I use it every day, pretty much every haircut. There's very few haircuts I don't blow dry, and all of those I generally use a Quiff Roller. There's a couple that I won't use a brush and I'll use my hand, but like I said, my client book's generally quite traditional, quite sort of uh, classic. So... We want to maintain the height of the haircut at the front and we want to flatten it a little bit at the back. So as you can see, while it's wet, his hair's wanting to stand up a little bit just where it's been cut. So I want to start with wet hair, otherwise drying it is absolutely pointless. So the purpose of the blow dry, we want to remove all of that moisture using the heat, but we want to use the direction of the air and the coat, the, uh, the bristles of the brush to create the shape and lock it in. So 
I'm going to start at the front and I'm going to create some height and then I'm going to blast the rest of the hair back, including the transition section there. So the direction of the air is going to depict where the hair is going to go. So I'm going to start at the front and again, using the quick roller, create a little bit of tension, drying the hair up like this because I want to keep that volume, I want to keep that height, taking care not to burn the forehead there. But I've got high heat, low speed, let the brush do the work. Just enough tension to pull it. And you could put the you could put the brush in behind. I'm trying not to curl the hair too much, so I'm going in underneath, locking it by twisting 180 degrees. And just pulling up. Releasing. We've uh, just had someone someone say that they started barbering by doing their level two hairdressing in college brownie and, and then working in a salon a couple of days a week. Yeah. Uh, just asking how you got your start. Yeah, exactly the same. Um, I got an apprenticeship to do level two in hairdressing. Um, I did everything. I did colouring. I did, you know, we, I mean, this was in, I was 18 and 31 now so it was a long time ago we had to do perms we had to do everything i wanted to learn everything find out what i enjoyed so i got stuck into everything found that cutting and styling was really what i enjoyed the most started to get more male clients in and in the salon uh, it was a unisex salon i had majority male clients so that was just kind of what i enjoyed and because i enjoyed it i excelled in it i was learning more i was putting more effort in the people that were enjoying that were coming back. So yeah, exactly the same thing. And I think whatever your whatever your course is, I think that's the best way to learn. So get a, you know get a certificate because you're going to learn a load of stuff at college. Get into a salon or a barber shop a day or two a week because you're going to learn stuff there, and then you can use all of that knowledge and mash together your own style of cutting hair. Right on. The one thing that you're missing off that sort of education list there is YouTube. Uh, Instagram, you know, you're also sat at home watching this, you know, and that doesn't ever go unnoticed by your clients when you're doing that little extra bit of extracurricular learning. It's just as important as your sort of traditional education methods, really, just staying on top of your skills. So now that the hair at the front's got volume and is dry, I'm going to start to dry everything else. So a lot of people watching this might think this guy's really nerdy. But it's nerdy stuff it's angles it's mathematics it's geometry it's engineering it's you know it's everything but it's art as well so we all have our own way of doing it so when i'm blow drying hair i have a target where's this hair going what's the final destination so if this hair's going up it's still going to be connected to the top without knock without knocking eugene's <laughs> nose off this is my destination because this is where the top meets the back and sides that final transition this is the direction of the hair this is the direction of the hair. All of these arrows are pointing to my target. This is where I want to dry the hair. Hot direction at the end when it's dry, we'll cool it down. So all my brush strokes are going to come back into the middle. I want to hit my target. All of my brush strokes are going to come back into the middle. I want to hit my target. And event it, it's tedious at first and you think, oh yeah, I need to make sure. Eventually it just becomes second nature. That's just how I will dry this haircut. You know, if this isn't the hairstyle and this isn't the direction your target's going to be somewhere else if it's a side parting and the hair kind of finishes here this is my target so whatever my target is i'm going to push all the hair into that area and don't worry if the crown wants to stick up a little bit i mean you can use your judgment to retain weight to hold the crown down but i'm generally because i've cut a square layer it's going to touch up just a little bit here but we'll tweak that with products at the end So yeah, high heat, hit that target, just nice and evenly, making sure I don't burn anywhere by focusing on one spot too hard. So here my target's right below, straight down. The airflow's going with this, this sort of uh, the shape of the hairstyle, but it's also flowing with the uh, cuticle layer of the hair. So the outer layer of the hair's got scales on it, if you were to sort of look under a microscope. And we want to smooth those off by drying them in a direction. If I was to go like this, it's going to disturb the flow, it's going to disturb the follicle and the, uh, the cuticle layer, sorry. 
So I want to go with that flow in anything classic, anything traditional. Again, that's the rule, it's there. We're going to follow it. You've had someone say that they're, um, that this live's better than a video. It's better than a pre-recorded brownie. Oh, that's um, cool, man. Yeah. It's awesome and feedback. If you've got any, any more feedback, feel free to drop it in there. We'll take it on board for future sessions for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the cool thing with being live, you know. We're so used to being in a room where you can be where that camera is and watch this haircut and ask us questions. And that's exactly why we're doing this, you know. The barbering community has been amazing for us, so we want to try and be here for the barbering community. So yeah, I mean, the more questions, the merrier, or, you know, just chime in, it's all good. You want me to, me to move the camera around and show you something different? Drop it in there, and angle. I'm just gonna boost this uh, power up to speed the process up a little bit. I'll try and keep it off the mic. So just maintaining the height there. I'm never gonna scrape this back. I'm always nice and gentle with this section here and then the top. Give it a bit more tension. Same on the sides. Back to my destination point, back to my target. And this really, the majority of the work here by the haircut, I'm just putting it into the, into the mental blueprint that I created before. It's up at the front, it's square on the top, it flows nicely and connects into the back and sides through this transition over the crown. It's symmetrical. Blow drying and product can only really do so much. It's just what's underneath that's gonna do all the groundwork. So by putting the structure in underneath, I'm allowing this haircut to last all day when it's styled properly. So one of the big things that I put into my into my haircut sessions, and again, I, I'm not sure if you can hear with the hair dryer on, it's something I'll teach my clients. So when you're blow drying for five minutes, it's it's dead time unless you're going to use that time to do something productive. So I will say like, oh, like do you style your hair at home? That's usually in the consultation. At this point, I'll say, all right, cool. This is how I style it. Have you got any questions or how do you style your hair at home, you know, and I'll teach the client. Eugene's really good at styling his hair. Some of you might recognize him from the Uppercut Deluxe website, actually, because he's on there already styling his hair. <laughs> but um, yeah, for the, you know, some clients might be shy and say, oh, I don't, I don't know what you're doing there, you know. It's our job to make sure the customer's comfortable doing this at home. We already know they're going to be able to do it because we've discussed it earlier in the consultation. So what I'm also doing now is I'm preparing for my next step. So this is step seven blow dry. I'm gonna move now into step eight, which is fine tuning. Just had someone ask if you ever do uh, use the uh, thinning shears, Brandon. One second. I just didn't hear you properly and I'm nearly done. No worries. Cool, sorry, hit me. Just had someone ask if you ever use thinning shears. Um, very very rarely um these kind of like classic haircuts generally you want to keep as much structure as possible and while thinning scissors probably have you know a place in it anything that i do sort of to remove any bulk i'm just going to use a straight shear with um i probably use my thinning shears once a month or something like that i've got them there in case i need them but it's very rare it's something I can either do with scissors or I'll sometimes use a texturizing razor. So yeah, this is going to move me out of the blow dry section into the next section, which is step eight, fine tuning. So what I was doing while I was drying the hair is I was looking for anything that I've missed, anything that can be better, anything that I might need to go over. And as the hair starts to dry, you might spot dark spots, which are where, you know, you might have missed a bit with the clipper work or things that can be a little better. Um, see, again, my gut, my gut told me to go for scissor over comb, but we've done that, so let's go with a bit of clipper over comb. 
So if there's anything that can be made better, and I've noticed while I'm looking in the mirror, there's just a tiny little bit of excess weight under my transition section there. So I'm just going to take that out. So yeah, fine tuning any sort of just final little tiny touches or tweaks that are going to just make it go from a, a nice haircut to a really nice haircut. And again, this isn't, it's not make or break. I could have quite happily put some product in this and sent it out the door and thought, yeah, I was, I was happy with that, but I could be a bit happier. And it's not a massive amount, but this is the point where I want to finish it. I want it to be polished. I want it to be perfect or as perfect as I'm going to get this, you know, this version of this haircut. So this is why I don't do the outline when I'm doing the back and sides. I'll always... Unless it's, you know, a skin fade and there is no outline, but on a traditional haircut, I'll leave the detailing and the outlining until the fine tuning section because it's a polish really. It's just to just to finish it, bring it into that sort of really nice haircut realm. And, you know, all of these little steps might take a few minutes, which add up to, you know, not everyone does a 45 minute haircut like I do and it obviously takes longer when you're explaining every step and doing a consultation and stuff but this is how I will approach every single haircut every single day and whether it's in front of people in a class or on YouTube or just a normal day in my barbershop this is just this is just the way and like I said the steps Sometimes the steps aren't as important or sometimes there's not as much to be done. You know, if you've got someone that gets their haircut every week, you're not going to spend as long on the consultation. But it doesn't mean you can't make up the time in fine tuning or styling or, you know, teaching the client something. So again, it comes coming out at that 45 degree angle to just take out any little blemishes. But I'm making sure I don't remove any of that length that I've deliberately kept in that transition period because that's going to give me a really nice glow when we put some, put some pomade in it. So um, the, classic, the classic kind of barber in me and the classic rule book that we've used would say, put something shiny in it, put something, put something you know, old school in it, which would make a lot of sense. But I've been absolutely obsessed with the uh, the new Uppercut Deluxe Clay and I can't stop using it. And I'm thinking it's probably going to look really cool in Eugene's hair. So I'm going to use the new clay, which we uh, we launched earlier this year, Riley. Yeah, just over uh, just a couple of months ago now. Yeah, cool. So strong hold, 8 out of 10 or so on the scale and a low shine. The, the classic barber in me is saying put deluxe pomade in and for anyone that's familiar with our product range deluxe pomade is water based pomade high shine strong hold it's awesome you know but I'm absolutely obsessed with using the clay at the moment so I'm going to mix it up and I'm going to uh, I'm going to break one of the classic rules and I'm going to use a clay but the reason being this structure and direction I want to make sure it's going to last all day the blow dry is only going to do so much while it's got it there. I just want to make sure it's going to last. So the clay, it's got oil based sort of properties, like it behaves like an old school wax or it behaves like a kind of old school wax based pomade, uh, like monster hold. It'll stay in the hair all day, but it's water based and it washes out, you know, even without shampoo, it'll just, it'll just come out with water and it's, it shouldn't. It shouldn't work, but it does, and I, I'm obsessed with it. So yeah, I'm going to use the clay. So I'm just using my detailer now. This is uh, for anyone interested. This is the Wall Beret, I believe. Um, again, I've tried every one under the sun. I've tried English ones, European ones, American ones. Luke Dolan was using these at an education session down south somewhere, and the haircut was awesome. And I was like, I'm going to buy those because then maybe I can do a haircut like that. So yeah. <laughs> Again, not sponsored. It might change. It's just what I'm using right now. Someone's just, uh, Matt's just asked to, uh, where the shop's located. 
Hey Matt, so we are in a place called Clitheroe, which in, I'm not sure how good your English geography is, so we're between sort of Blackburn, Burnley, Preston, so we're probably about 45 minutes or an hour outside of Manchester is the like biggest kind of... In the UK? Yeah, in the local city in England, UK. Um, it's where I grew up, it's where I went to school, um, I just can't escape, I can't get away, so yeah, I opened a shop here, so now I'll never leave. <laughs> but yeah, it's just like a quiet little market town, you know. It's um, and this is the weird thing when I started when I started hairdressing, before I even got like dead into doing men's hair. Instagram didn't exist, like, and I know that sounds like crazy, but I didn't take a camera phone to college, and I, you know, I kind of get sad sometimes. I see the like upload a first haircut picture, the first haircut you ever did at college, and I'm like, I don't have pictures of any of the haircuts I did at college. Probably for the best because they probably sucked, but. Yeah, you know, like back then that wasn't a thing, but now, you know, and that, I used to kind of be a little bit worried about getting stuck in the like small town and not being able to leave and, you know, so I joined a band and tried to escape and that didn't work, so, but yeah, you know, like the, the internet's made that world so small now, so I've connected with barbers all over the world and I don't feel like I'm, you know, I always used to be like, I need to have a shop in London or I need to, you know, move to a different country and open a shop in la or something to be successful but you know there's people that want nice haircuts absolutely everywhere in the world so you don't actually have to kind of strive for that fake oversold dream when when eugene lives around the corner eugene wants a haircut if i move to london eugene's not going to get his haircut so yeah you know you you kind of get to grips with being from a little small town and realizing that there's not actually anything wrong with it so yeah, I just had someone else ask what the story is with the Virgin of Guadalupe sticker on the mirror. Oh yeah, where? So this is uh, actually, um, I mean, I've, I get lost. There's so many things on here, and I change it every few months. I take everything down and start from scratch. Um, <laughs> that I got. It's a postcard from Austin, Texas, and I mean, you can see some kind of like other Texas paraphernalia. If anyone can tell me what that is, I'll send you a free tin of pomade. Because that's my favourite sticker. So if you can, if you know what this is, I'll send you a free tin of pomade. But yeah, that's a postcard from Texas. Um, this is just all kind of stuff that I I like. Barbershops, got like Benjamin's, got Hutto's, got others, well, got Kushti from SB. Just stuff that I've kind of like collected and enjoy. And you know, the barbershop's a place to express yourself. You can express yourself in your work, but you can express yourself on your There's workstation. Some of cool stuff. Huh? If your boss permits it. <laughs> you know, I love the look of these like really clean cut sort of like clinical barb shops that are, you know, white and pure. But I mean, that's not me. Like, look at look at the state of me. So <laughs> cool. So I've just finished off the outline. What I'm going to do right at the end is just get Eugene to hold his mask on with his hands and uh, buzz the sideburns down to match. But I'm just going to remove any hair from the client from the gown. She's in a little neck brush. And this will get disinfected after, because that is the world we live in now. If it touches anyone, it's got to get cleaned. So I'm going to use my hairdryer to just remove all of that hair debris. So, again. And now we're going to move on to styling. So I'm going to use the clay and I'm happy with the haircut. I'm happy with the structure. Um, so now it's time for styling. So I'll try my best to open this in front of the camera. For anyone that hasn't used this product, what are you playing at? So it's very strong. It's very tough. Put it next to my microphone and you can hear it. So it's going to behave like an oil-based product, something old school, something grippy, something strong, but it's gonna wash out. I know that doesn't make sense. You just have to trust me. So I'm gonna take, because I didn't use anything to pre-style, I'm gonna take a sort of generous clump of clay. Um, and do you know what? I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't gonna do this, but I'm gonna show a little trick. So if anyone has used the clay and doesn't know this, this is how I use it pretty much every time. So put the tin down I'm gonna put this in my hand like this get anything off my nail 
I'm going to get my hair dryer and I'm going to warm it up. It might seem a bit crazy or counterproductive, but I'm going to warm it up in my hand anyway by using friction. It's tough, so it's going to be a little bit faster with a hair dryer. Make sure you don't burn yourself, just low heat, low power, warm it up in your hands. You can see how much I'm using there. Don't be scared to use too much, you know, the, the clay is just fine. And now you can see it spreads really easy. So rub it into the hands and I'm just going to distribute it evenly through the hair. I'm going to get a little bit on the roots, I'm going to get a little bit on the ends, I'm going to get it all the way through. So gut reaction when you start styling hair, you want to go like that. It's coming this way. You want to pull it through. Don't do it. Start at the back. So massage into the hair. I've got products on my palms, it's on my fingers. Massage it into the hair, front to back, not being too rough. Don't want to pull the hair out. And then start at the back, small sections, work your way forward. Just want to get the hair evenly coated. If we do that at the start, all the hair at the front is going to have product on. Everything behind it's not going to have any power, any hold any weight from the product so it's not going to last the same once you've got the product in there that's when you want to start slicking the hair back a little bit so i'm just going to follow exactly the same rule as i did with my hair my hair dryer before when we we're doing the blow dry everything's coming back to that target destination the sides the transition the top but i don't want to put too much tension on the front because i want to keep that height so Classic haircuts are all about flow. They're all about having a nice, clean profile, generally comb lines. So I'm just going to use uh, my, I'm going to use my clipper comb, something with a sort of medium to wide tooth comb, and just follow what I've done direction wise, gently, height at the front. Just pull this down. And one of the things I generally like to do with this haircut is just give it a little bit of a bit of a nudge. Keep that height at the front, like that, and then just flatten off the top, just a touch. Again, up at the front, everything else is going to come back to my destination target. And I'm not overworking it with the comb, I'm just kind of letting the hair go where the hairdryer put it. And you know, you can, you can go as old school as you want, you know, you can flick the fringe out a little bit and kind of have it coming forward whatever your kind of preference is, but I think straight up for Eugene's hair is pretty cool. So all of these steps that we've just sort of gone through, all the way from zero through to nine, this is how I would do a classic uppercut deluxe haircut. And I've finished it with the clay, just to get that strong hold power. And I'm just checking the symmetry of the styling like Eugene would when he's doing it in a mirror at home. Something like this. How's that, Riley? Hey, unreal. Would you let me cut your hair? <laughs> you don't need to now, because you know day, what to man. do, man. Yeah. yeah, you know, and this is just a day, day-to-day -day thing in my barbershop. This is the style I like to cut. This, it's probably, I mean, I take 45 minutes to do a haircut and all of those steps fit well within 45 minutes. I've got plenty of time to spend a little bit longer on consultation if I want, plenty of time to clean down at the end, plenty of time to get ready for the next guy and give him a nice haircut. That's what it's all about. As Luke, Luke Dolan says, it's what it's all about. I'm happy with that. And there we have the first ever Uppercut Deluxe Virtual Education stream. Live. Good work, man. Yes. <laughs> Rad stuff, man. I just want to take a minute to thank everyone that helped this come together. Riley, Scotty, Paddy, Chris, Ed, uh, UCDC boys, ambassadors that helped us just, you know, we've worked on it for so long and to get it out in the world has been fun. Like, it's been a great project. So, yeah. That's and how what I a do fantastic this cut for the first ever 
He's a good, mate. He's a good model, man. And like I said, <laughs> I'm just going to go over the sideburns um, with the number one guard. Just match them up to the uh, the back and sides. Right on. It's nothing too exciting. No one's going to miss out on seeing that. So there we have it. Front to back. Full classics uppercut look session. Cool as, man. How was that, Riley? Did you have fun? I had a great time. Good man. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for tuning in, guys. Thank you, Eugene, and, for uh, showing up and sitting and yeah. looking pretty. Thanks to you, Eugene. Thanks to everyone who fired questions away in the chat. We greatly appreciate it. Um, you know, their interaction. You know, we really appreciate everyone asking those questions and getting involved and and yeah, showing sharing some love. So no, it was an awesome session. Uh, we want to hear more from you. Um, tune in again we're going to do this again we're looking to make this a more regular thing absolutely um yeah speak to speak to whoever your uh be it your distributor or even your local sales rep if you if you stock up or cut your shop and you there's maybe something different you want to see or or yeah um fire it off in the in the chat now if there's anything you want to see differently next time um yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll leave the chat open for a few minutes if people want to kind of like chat in there ask any more questions like i'll i'll pick them up if i can if you want to reach out to us on social media, it's at Uppercut Deluxe or mine is at Chris Brownless Hair. Ask questions, you know, get in touch, like let's connect. That's what it's all about. Um, it won't be me every time doing this. Uh, we've got loads of great ambassadors, educators that, you know, we want to roll this out with. So right stay, stay tuned and keep, keep, out, keep an eye out for the next one. Wicked. Right on. Good work. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Eugene. Thanks, Riley. <laughs> Thank you, Brownie. Good night. Thank you again.